Fort in Belfast. My dad got me my start. Then my brother's after me. He could hear the noise from where we lived, but nothing prepared you for the size of the They put me to work on 401. That's what we call that. And you should be the largest passenger ship in the world. We didn't call her Titanic then. I was there from the beginning. I was the ship race to the keel blocks. They sent the wooden blocks on the ship way to start with. Then the keel at top of that, like a backbone. And the frames attached to that, like a skeleton. Workshops everywhere. It took weeks to find a way around. The workshops for every trade you ever heard of. Painters, sail makers, copper smiths, boiler makers, cabinet makers. I even learned a bit about French balls and everything. Harlow was just a fine place to work, but dangerous. Every ship cost a life, and there'd be lots of injuries besides. I was in the engine works for a while. Very well equipped it was. That's where we built the triple expansion engines. Two of them, each as high as a three-story house. I worked in the frame bending shop. You had heat steel beams in the furnace, then hooked them onto slabs of cast iron, and hung them curved. It was skilled work. You had to bend them more than you needed, because the frame straightened out a little when it could. The shell plates had made up a hull weighed up to four and a half tons. <laughs> they were taller than the dark. The plates were overlapped on the edges. Some were raised, one after another. We called it Lyncher. One of the four men taught me years ago. That's how you built these ships. as a heater boy. You had to heat the rivets on a wee plate. You pump the bellows till the rivet was quite hot. Then you get a hold of it with your tongs and throw it up to the catcher. And he put it in the hole in the plate for the holder up. There were two of us on the other side of the plate for the holder up. We had to hammer the rivets so it filled the hole before it turned on red. The double bottom. That's a wee space we call the tanks made up of steel plates. The rest of the rivet squad all had to fit into that gap. One of the four men would check each other with a special hammer. If it made a ringing sound, we'd have to go back and chase it out after work. I'd get scared working down in that double bottom. You only had candles for light. And the constant hammering against the shell plates. You could hear it all over Belfast. Some of those boys ended up stone deaf, so they did. We were paid 31 bob a week. The heater boy and catcher got 16 bob. But we all worked the same 54 hours. The upper deck was steel too, and part of the strength of the ship. There's no straight lines in the ship. And when you look down the weather deck, you can see the shear of the hull, the stop her flexing at sea. The stern frame had to be strong enough to take the rudder turning in heavy seas. You had to hold these timbers and guy wires to steady the frame, and then scurrying around like ants underneath. When we came to launch day, I was torn between pride and fear. The standing wings were coated in tallow, train oil and soft soap. So the ship would slide when they shifted her weight off the blocks. That was the most dangerous part. And the shipwrights were not going to weigh the last props. They were under compression, you see, and the sliding ways would be released by the hydraulic trigger. One hundred thousand people watched the launch. Some paid a bob to sit in the reserved seating. There were extra trams laid on. Then we all went off to the pub to wish her well. Doc, you were proud to be an island man that day. And Titanic was the pride of Belfast. Thank you for joining us. The tour will end in a few seconds. Please exit the car carefully and make sure you don't leave any personal possessions behind. When the car has stopped, Push the lap bar down and lift up to exit safely. And mind your step as you leave the car.